Welcome, Welcome to the, to the Breaking, Breaking News Program, program that delves, that delves into, into the heart of Mormonism, Mormonism your, weekly your weekly window into the unique, unique intersection, intersection of news, history, history and, culture. and culture that resonates that with, with the tapestry of Mormonism. Of Mormonism. So, whether, so whether you are tuning, tuning in from the heart of Utah, Utah or joining, or joining us, from us from around the world, your favorite, your favorite news, news program, program starts, starts now. now. Where news meets insights and the stories of our faith unfold. All right. Welcome to the Mormon Newscast, everybody. I'm Bill Real. Let me turn this a little bit, get a little better lighting. Uh, Rebecca, you said that sounded a little bit like me with a little bit of a, like a voice made a little higher. And RFM, I heard the rumor was that you agreed with her. So I'm, I uh, went and got a, a different voice to do that intro without really having, I was trying to get away from my voice. Uh, because I we think you should stick with your voice. Okay. Well, maybe I'll switch it back. It sounds a little bit like Pee Wee Herman, I think, which. Not that that's a bad thing. Not, but, it's not yeah, a bad but, thing. <laughs> And it's very dramatic. Like it kind of has an echo, at least from where I was hearing, kind of like, welcome, yeah. welcome, welcome. So very <laughs> dramatic. I love it. We'll have to change it up. All right. So, folks, welcome to the Mormon Newscast. Here we are. It is the 11th of March, 2024. Uh, I will put up here on the screen. Uh, that's just the image for the start, uh, the image for the promo. But I wanted to talk for a moment about what stories we'll go into tonight. We will lead off with a short uh, video I recorded on the Kirtland Temple purchase. Uh, but what I think is going to make the most interesting conversation tonight, folks, is I hope you hang around uh, for the rest of the show. There's going to be a, a long conversation about multiple data points about whether folks are staying, whether folks are leaving, or if they leave, do they come back? And there's some disagreement here, and the data seems pretty polarized uh, at the extremes, uh, pointing to uh, different conclusions here. And I think it's going to be interesting to get uh, your the perspective of the two of you. Uh, I'll add in my two cents and we'll see what happens. And then we'll finish off with a, a bit of a fun story, but sort of don't recognize how leaders think things through because what ends up happening is that an apostle of the Lord ties up the young adults of the church and tells them it's a good thing. So we'll get to that here in a moment too. I am uh, accompanied here by my co-host, Rebecca Re Biblioteca and Radio Free Mormon. How are the two of you guys tonight? Excellent. Thank you. I'm feeling so good, Bill. Thank you for asking. Yeah. <laughs> RFM is a little under the weather, so uh, we'll see how this goes. Hopefully uh, he's doing good. Your voice does sound better than I thought it was going to, so I, you sound great. Thank you. I've taken a huge shot of something, and so I've also got a lozenge in my mouth. You may hear that clicking against my teeth. If so, I apologize. But yes, absolutely. I'm here, ready to go, excited for tonight's show. Awesome. Well, let's start off here with the uh, video on the Kirtland Temple and lead off the news program. Good evening. News tonight revolves around a significant development just a little over one week ago in the Mormon world. As the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, commonly known as the LDS or Mormon Church, announced the purchase of the historic Kirtland Temple along with several other key historical sites and historical documents. The LDS Church acquired the Kirtland Temple, located in Kirtland, Ohio, along with other historic buildings and artifacts for an estimated $192.5 million. The purchase has sparked a range of emotions within the Mormon religious community, particularly among members of both the LDS Church and their cousins, the Community of Christ, who had long held a connection to the Kirtland Temple. The Kirtland Temple, considered the first temple of the Mormon faith, has been a symbol of historical significance for the Community of Christ, formerly known as the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The news of its sale has been met with a sense of sadness and concern among the community members who have cherished the temple as a vital part of their religious heritage, and who worry that a more accurate and a more full telling of the early history will disappear as the LDS Church takes over the historical tours of these sites. While the sale may be disheartening for some, there is also a heightened interest in understanding the LDS Church's plans for these acquired properties. The Church has not only obtained the Kirtland Temple, but also other properties as well, as historical documents, such as the Smith Family Homestead, the Mansion House, the Nauvoo House, the Red Brick Store, 
Significant documents and artifacts include manuscripts and the Bible used in the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. Seven letters from Joseph Smith to his wife, Emma. John Whitmer's history of the church. Original portraits of Joseph and Emma Smith and the cornerstone of the Nauvoo House. The original door of the Liberty Jail and the Charles Anton document, supposedly with the reformed Egyptian on it, with the title of characters, which is supposed to include inscriptions from the gold plates that made up the Book of Mormon. The purchase of such significant historical artifacts and sites for a substantial amount raises questions regarding the community of Christ's financial well-being and curiosity about the LDS Church's motivations and future initiatives utilizing these properties and documents. As of now, details regarding the church's specific plans for these acquisitions and whether they intend to share historical documents with the public remain undisclosed. The religious community and historians and the public at large are left to ponder the future impact of this landmark purchase by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. On a personal note, I grew up in Sandusky, Ohio, around an hour and a half drive for me to go to Kirtland, and I had been there numerous times. I had met several times Locke Mackay, current apostle in the community of Christ and former director or curator of the Kirtland Temple. I think he is best suited to express what this transfer means for the community of Christ and for others feeling melancholy over this deal. As an introvert, I hate talking about myself. Today, I'm going to make an exception. My grandmother was Lois Smith Larson, a daughter of President Frederick Madison Smith and granddaughter of Joseph Smith III. I grew up attending Smith family reunions in Nauvoo and Independence, but it wasn't until after university that I fell in love with our story. Following several summer internships, I ended up as director of the Kirtland Temple Historic Site and spent 15 years living literally in the shadow of Kirtland Temple. I moved to Nauvoo in 2007 and have lived on the Joseph Smith Historic Site for 18 years. These places have been my home for almost my entire adult life. I met my wife, Kristen, in the red brick store in Nauvoo and was ordained to my first and favorite priesthood office, teacher in Kirtland Temple. I've almost certainly given more tours of Kirtland Temple than any living person. And the Nauvoo House, Homestead, and Mansion House are my ancestral homes. For me, the decision to part with these places has been devastating emotionally. There was a time when I thought it might break me, but if I inherited anything from Joseph Smith III, it's his pragmatism, and intellectually, the path forward is clear. I care deeply about our past, but I care even more about our future. The post-pandemic world has changed. The needs have never been greater, and we no longer have the resources, human or financial, to care for these places the way they deserve to be cared for. The Smith family, like larger church family in the 1830s and 40s, suffered extraordinary losses in Ohio, Missouri, and Illinois, but they faithfully persevered. The most important items in this transaction came to the church from the family. So the proceeds from the sale at some level are an extraordinarily generous gift from them that will sustain us as we move into the future. I think they would feel good about that. Amid my grief, so do I. For President Stephen Vesey, I can only imagine he wanted to ensure this was finalized prior to the next president prophet, Stacy Cram, taking over leadership as the first female prophet president of the Community of Christ or of any Mormon faction as far as I know, I can only imagine how unfairly she may have been criticized 
if this had happened under her watch. While Latter-day Saints are feeling glee over a long-held rumor finally coming to fruition, the community of Christ and many others are grieving over their loss, both of the temple itself and as an outward manifestation of their version of early church history. With a wealth of 265 million, the LDS Church has the resources to strategically shape its future and has done so here. However, given its history of narrative control and obfuscation regarding problematic issues, it would be reasonable to be skeptical about the church utilizing these properties and documents to ensure that accurate history is valued and told. So uh, I wanted to get your thoughts and then I'll share maybe kind of a, kind of a concluding thought uh, after that. But Rebecca, what do you think about this transfer of not just the Kirtland temple, but several really important properties to church history and lots of documents that also I think have a lot of value uh, in our historical narrative. Yeah, there are so many angles to this. I think there have been so many podcasts. I myself did one. And I, I think in the words of my co-host Landon, he said, uh, Brigham has finally completed the takeover of Joseph's church. <laughs> and he said it a little facetiously, but there is truth in that. I think all of us were trying to figure out how did this happen? Who made the decision? I reached out to some people in the community of Christ that um, assured me that it was a sort of a combination of the outgoing prophet, the incoming prophet, the presiding bishop and the apostles, like the leadership did know it wasn't something that kind of happened lightly, but then there were many others that didn't know. And I think that's where the story got, as you said, very emotional as we talked to some of these people that it, it were really blindsided by it. Um, but to be brief, I think, I think the concern when they talk about now all these buildings and artifacts and documents in the hands of the church are it's founded in do they now control the narrative what will happen to the narrative the community of christ narrative is very different i think from the um, LDS narrative. And I think about missionaries staffing these buildings, and I wonder if some of the stories that the Community of Christ guides used to tell will be told. I had a friend who went to the site and they pointed to where the incident, the Fanny Alger incident happened. Well, will the LDS missionaries even be aware, number one, <laughs> of that narrative? And if they were, would they share it? Will they explain why the Kirtland Temple was abandoned? Will they explain about the banking crisis or and give that true information? Will they point up to the over the archway of the temple where it says the Church of Latter Day Saints? And will they explain perhaps why the names were changed? a little frequently in early church history because there were creditors after the church. These are part of the history. These are things the community of Christ shares that I'm not sure if the LDS church will share. So while I know that they do a good job of taking care of buildings, they're pristine, they look amazing. Sometimes it seems like the heart and soul of some of these buildings disappear when they're whitewashed a little by a different narrative and just presentation. So that, those are kind of my initial thoughts. RFM, your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I saw this. This happened, I think it was a week ago today, was it, that the news broke? And I was, uh, or or Tuesday, anyways, flying back from Utah. Once again, the lozenges. I apologize. But, and everybody's going crazy about it. And I'm thinking, rarely has any real estate transaction caused so much controversy. But then I put myself back 30, 40 years as a member of the church. And the acquiring by the LDS church of this temple, I would have seen it as the church is true, right? So a real estate transaction, because the LDS church has enough money and the reorganized church or church of Christ has so little money that they're in a position where they have to sell. Now this transaction takes place and it's like the second coming. And I can only imagine what people who think that Jesus Christ is coming along with that second eclipse on April 8th of this year are thinking about this. Although I do have an inside line that reached out to me the same day this broke. Who is an attorney who has, at least in the past, worked for the church, who wanted to give me some inside information, which I'll pass along to you for what it's worth. First off, this person 
uh, has worked as an attorney in similar kind of acquisitions, large, big acquisitions in the past. And not on this one, though. Want to make that clear. But he told me that that $195 million, that may be what the church paid. But in his opinion, that's nowhere near what was paid total to acquire these buildings, these documents. And what he told me was that it's very common for the church, and indeed did happen with the uh, transaction he was working on in the past, reach out to well-heeled members and ask them to give a sizable donation, which they can then use as a tax write-off. And they pool millions and millions of dollars that way, in addition to whatever it is the church pays. And it was his opinion that the church is paying $195 million, but the total amount being paid is much larger than that due to the donations, which are not paid by the church, but are being used as part of the transaction. Anyway, it was also this person's opinion that, and I heard a little bit of it in that video you played of the president of the church, the, the Community of Christ Church, which is they have certain obligations that they have to fulfill financially. And some of those have to do with the pensions for full-time people and historical individuals, uh, people in history. They're historians, as well as other people who have uh, pensions. And those pensions are in danger of not being fully funded. And so this transaction was entered into in order to ensure the fact that their pensions would be there for them and would be fully funded. And then after that, you know, we'll just have to see what happens. But the, I, I feel like that's what they were more interested in. They had to make a choice between the history and these dearly held properties that they have had for, well, since the beginning, practically, excuse me. And they went with um, the needs of their, their members and their employees today. So having said all that, this does remind me, though, um, when I was a kid, I used to play Monopoly. And when I was a grown up, I played Monopoly with my kids. Excuse me. There comes a point in every Monopoly game, and they're all painful. I hate the game. I just hate it. And I'll do anything I can to make it go as fast as possible, including cheating. I just want you to know that. So, but there comes a point after all this tiresomeness of buying properties and everything, there comes a point where it's clear who's going to end up winning the game. And the game isn't over yet, but it's obvious the person who's got the hotels and the properties and everybody else just has to keep rolling and going around and landing on their properties and having to pay the rent. We know it is who it is who's going to win the game because they got all the money. And then it's just the painful process of getting to that point where they actually break everybody in half and take all their money because they have to pay it all. So, excuse me. That's what I see happening here. And sometimes I've actually been the person who had all the money. Now that's rare, but it has happened when I was cheating artfully enough to get to that position. But there's a feeling you have when you're the top dog and you've got all the money and you're watching everybody go broke and you laugh demonically. But more often, there's the feeling on the other side of it when you're not the person with all the hotels and you're the one who's going through the bankruptcy process. And that is a very different feeling. Now, I know there's a lot more emotion invested on both sides of this than a stupid Monopoly game, but I think it's the same kind of thing, which is where we have one church who has all the money and the other church who has resisted what I'm sure are continuous uh, efforts and offers to buy their properties, but putting it off, putting it off, putting it off because they mean so much to them. And finally, they're at the point where they have to break and they have to sell. So they're going to get the best that they can for them to take care of their members. And I just, I'm a different person than I was 40 years ago. And most of that's to the good. But 40 years ago, I just would have been doing the dance of joy and saying the, the church is true, the LDS church is true, and the Uriah organized or not. And that's why we finally got the, the Kirtland Temple back from them together with all these other properties, which are so important in church history. But now at 64, I can look at it and say, you know, I get being happy about it, but I think we need to take into account the extreme uh, sadness, which I, I heard all over that video that you played. I'm glad you played that, Bill from the people on the other side. And I think we just need to be a little tempered or the Mormons, the LDS church needs to be a little bit more tempered in its celebrations and taking into account the fact that on the other side are people who have given the last best thing that they ever had in their lives. Lots of them feel that way. So I wanted to say that. And so that's about all 
that I have to say, except for, it does remind me of the old expression. I think the LDS church is fulfilling it, that the one who dies with the most toys wins. And I think the LDS church is going to do that. <laughs> they sure as hell are. <laughs> I mean, you, all the other Mormon factions could band together, throw their money into one pot, and they wouldn't have enough to overcome it. So, and it wouldn't even be close. I just want to note a couple of things to wrap up this story. In terms of the LDS church in their newsroom acknowledging the full scope of this, I think they did. It, and it surprised me a little bit, but not really. Once they tied to the hip of another entity who was uh, basing much of how they behave in real time in honesty, transparency, authenticity, the LDS church had no choice but to say exactly what properties they bought, what documents it was. And I have a hunch because like so many times in the past, had they not been tied to the community of Christ in this deal, like all the other deals of buying up land, buying up businesses, buying up property, buying up whatever it is, putting money in the stock market with the SEC, the church has done anything but be transparent. It shows you what kind of organization the community of Christ is for why they were being forthright about what this deal entailed. Second is there is some good to this. The LDS church, because it has uh, bottomless pockets, it can ensure as long as its motive is to keep these buildings open for tours, it has enough money to throw at these buildings to repair them. I was telling URFM uh, about a week ago that one of the things I expected, because I'd been to Kirtland so many times, I was never able to go up to the third floor of the Kirtland Temple. The staircase there, I'll just note it for people, it has 33 steps representative uh, uh, as symbolic of each year of Christ's life. Supposedly, he dies when he's 33 years old. And when you get to the second floor, you get to go in there, but they won't take you up to the third floor because it's in such dire repair. Well, when the Deseret News reported on this transfer, there was a comment in there that they uh, expected to be able to reopen that third floor, which just points to the amount of money the church can throw at it and keep this old falling apart building, repair it and restore it and have it be uh, functioning in top shape. And in that respect, we can at least hold out hope that these properties will essentially last to the millennium because the church has enough money and it seems to take a lot of pride in its historical assets um, th that I think we can at least applaud the fact that these properties will exist far into the future. And so I think there are some good things that come out of this as well. Yeah. You know what else has 33 steps to it? What's that? Scottish Rite Masonry. Oh, 33 well, degrees. That. What Scottish a coincidence. Rite Masonry. It may be a, a coincidence. <laughs> Strangely enough, where does the endowment come from? Masonry. Well, Masonry. <laughs> <laughs> Can I make one more point very quickly? Mm -hmm. um, from people that are in the know, uh, this theory has kind of been thrown around, and that is that this actually was supposed to be announced at conference, probably the last session. We have acquired the Kirtland Temple. However, the story was broken quite early by our friend John Hychek, who had bid on the temple and then was kind of made aware that he had not perhaps been a successful bidder. Anyway, it all kind of broke. A lot of people feel that this was supposed to be a huge announcement at LDS General Conference and perhaps something of a fulfillment of those words that President Nelson said a few conferences ago about unleashing the incredible power of the universe. I know that's not exactly it, but you know what I'm talking about. He made a prediction that we would- Although uh, the things. greatest, the great signs of God and everything, yeah. we'll see bigger yeah. signs from God than ever before. Yes. My powers, my priesthood's right, yes. go ahead. I think that's from Star Wars, it, it, one or the other. Anyway, no, and, and so a lot of people felt that was gonna happen, but then it was, you know, unfortunately or fortunately kind of leaked. And then of course they had everything prepared with the statements and everything. I'm not saying this is what happened, but a lot of people do feel this. And, and my last comment is, as you talk about unleashing power, at least they did not purchase the greater temple lot, which the community of Christ owns and the actual temple lot, which of course is owned by another group, the temple lot group. Can you imagine if they would have purchased those at this particular time when, you know, you did the podcast Mormonism Live on the seventh seals and everything that's supposed to happen on October 8th. If they would have purchased that greater temple lot from the community of Christ, I think all, you know, what would have broken loose because that means the end is near. It's happening. 
the really? church yes, is you're right. selling its land in Missouri, not buying it. Exactly. That's exactly it. <laughs> and this year is not only a leap year, but April Fool's Day will be held on April 8th this year. That's it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca, why don't you uh, take us into uh, get us kind of started down the path of all of this data pouring in all at the same moment yeah. about who's coming, who's going, who's staying, who's leaving and who's coming back. Yep, there was so much in the news this week, which is really exciting, all about actual data that's happening. And maybe you can pull up my first slide so I can, there we go. Okay, perfect. So, and again, of course, I love AI. I just have so much fun with it. So there was a major um, story put out by Jana Reese in the Religion News Service. It was also covered in the Tribune. And it's called, Who is Leaving the LDS Church? Um, eight Key Survey Findings. And of course, my artwork is what everybody thinks people who leave the church look like, right? A biker gang. So <laughs> Not the case we're going to find out. Um, so I'll just read this very quickly to explain how the survey was conducted because it was very interesting. Um, the people who conducted it, uh, Josh Coates and Stephen Cranny, wanted to know more about members and former members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They had to strategize about the best ways to reach them. More and more people aren't answering surveys either by phone or online. Well, that's true, I think. <laughs> so reaching a small minority population like Latter-day Saints is notoriously difficult. Difficult. So they resurrected an old school methodology. And if you're viewing, you can see my graphic here. They sent 80,000 physical postcards to randomly selected households in the Mormon corridor, Morador and supplemented with target, targeted Facebook ads to a Utah audience. Both methods led respondents to take an online survey um, that was then weighed to be representative of the LDS population. After they removed late and invalid responses, they had a sample of 2,625 current and 1,183 former Latter-day Saints. So the data that we're going to go over right now is based on this survey um, that basically came from postcards, which I think is really cool and old school. So there were eight key findings, and I just these were just fascinating to me. Um, you know, we we hear all kinds of data about people that have left, people that stay, why people leave, but this is this is a really good survey with I think some really accurate findings. So one of the things they found are that former members are more likely to be LGBTQ. In the survey, only 4% of current members identified as LGBTQ compared to 18% of the former members. Now, their speculation on this is, of course, is that perhaps they left, stepped away because the LDS church is not seen as being conducive um, or even friendly in some cases to members of the LGBTQ community. That could be one of the reasons. Another reason, of course, could be that once you step away and you're not in that high demand, high control construct anymore, you're more free to explore who you are personally. And, and this may be where you arrive. So more research done on this, but an interesting finding. Can, can I Let's, just note? That, yeah, uh, jump in anytime, any of in, you. In the general population, I believe the data is somewhere around 7 to 9% of people identify themselves as mm -hmm. uh, not heterosexual. And hence, like you say, it, it, kind of, it sort of makes statistical sense that in a smaller subgroup where almost all of them leave, you would be left with a very small number in the big group they left from. You would have a significantly larger number in the group that they moved to. Um, th that makes sense to me. And as you also point out, it's also free at that point to just be who you are. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway. Yep, exactly. Any thoughts on that, RFM? I guess we can just kind of talk about each point because they're all so interesting. No, no thoughts for me. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Let's go on to the next one. Um, another thing the survey revealed is that few have a traditional belief in God without any doubts. It says the 2023 current and former Latter-day Saints survey repeated a long-standing question from the General Social Survey about belief in God. Comparing the current and former members, the difference in belief are stark. And you can see this from this graph. I'm guessing you can already guess if you can't read the legend what we're talking about here. Among current members, more than seven in 10 say they know that God really exists. And that's what you see here uh, with these green lines. Um, each column is um, basically how they took the survey, online postcard. So these are faithful members um, over on the left-hand side. And those long green lines say, we know God exists. They have no doubt about it. 
Um, that's more than six times the rate of certainty about God among former members. So you look over to the right hand column and you see that green, you know, it, it's a much smaller representation. Purple and some of the other colors mean I believe in a higher power. I think there might be a God, but I'm not sure. I'm atheist. I'm agnostic. Basically, on a very simplistic level, the data says when you leave the church, you're exploring, you're figuring it out. There's no common answer where everyone who leaves says, I don't believe this, or I do believe this. Everyone is sort of on their personal journey is what this statistic tells me on the right hand set of columns. The left hand set, of course, says we've got it locked down. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Any thoughts on this interesting finding? I will Only tell you that I'm not so much surprised that the seven out of 10 of the members of the church say they know. I'm surprised that there are still as many who say they say that, that they know that there's a God after they've left the church, mm -hmm. even though it's, you know, six times smaller. I'm surprised that it's that many. And I'll just say that of current members, seven out of 10 know that God exists. I actually am, think that to be lower than I would have expected it to be. The mm -hmm. amount of certainty, I think if you would have gone back to the 1990s, early 2000s, and ask current members if they knew God exists, I would imagine that number to be up around 85 or 90 percent. Um, I, I think that number is actually surprisingly low and may speak to sort of uh, a little bit of doubt running through the system among current, current membership on some level. Yeah, I kind of had those, those thoughts, too, that this survey being a post-COVID church survey, I think there may be some differences in just the way people are thinking, but, but really interesting to look at that. Uh, let's see, another interesting development from the survey there. And when we say there, we are talking about people that have stepped away, self-reported from the Mormon church, from the LDS church, their moral priorities look very different. And that I don't think surprises us. Um, former Mormons, it turns out, have much in common with liberals in general population with high ratings for care and fairness, meaning that is something they really value and care about. Meanwhile, current members look more like conservatives, but with a particularly high emphasis on purity and sanctity, something that former Mormons do not stress much at all. Now, that's very interesting. What are your thoughts on that? That part, I have to say, in? no surprises here. <laughs> exactly. Purity uh, and sanctity. That's it. Yeah. It, I, I just want to know, people who have left want to see harm reduced, want to see people cared for more than the current membership of the church, and that the current membership of the church more highly treasures loyalty and authority uh, and the outward sign of purity, right? But it seems like the ones who have left are actually more concerned about helping mm -hmm. their fellow man in real time in terms of reducing harm and caring for people. Can I add something else about that statistic you had on the former graph about six times or six times fewer people after they leave the church say they know God exists? I think that it's possible that part of the explanation for that drastic reduction is the number of the seven out of 10 people in the church who say they know God lives, who are actually conflating that statement with, I know the church is true. And if you know the church is true, then obviously God lives because he's the guy who is leading the church and meeting with the apostles on the fourth floor of the Salt Lake Temple before construction every Thursday for brunch. So I think that if you know the church is true, you're going to be one of these seven out of ten. I certainly was when I knew the church was true. And now that I don't know the church is true, uh, my beliefs about God have been impacted accordingly. No, that's a good point. And so the, that purple area right there on the believer side could just mean I'm not sure if my church is the true church. So that is a really fascinating point. All right. These are also good. We could probably do a whole podcast on each one of these. <laughs> Instead, we're breezing through and we would encourage anyone to look up these articles. Just, just wonderful. So moral priorities. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Bill. Um, just the idea that now we're actually doing as opposed to maybe looking like we're doing or doing under duress. So, and this is a very positive one. I love this because it means that humanity is being cared for. So, all right, let's look at our next one. Okay, this probably is not surprising to anybody either. There are more likely to have been, they are more likely to have been divorced. Again, these are people that have stepped away 
and sorry, I'm flipping my papers here. Um, the survey respondents who were still members of the LDS church, the divorce rate for the first marriage was 18%, while for former members, it was 39%. So still in the church, 18 having left 39. The former member's rate is closer to the national average of the, for divorces in the United States. Coates said the rate of temple divorce is especially low, between 14 to 20%, and we've heard that before, while marriages between members that are not sealed in the temple are closer to the national rate of about half of marriages ending in divorce. And I'm sure there are lots of factors in this. Anecdotally, I do know people that once they step away, they question all the life decisions that they made. And one of the big ones is, you know, why did I marry when I did? Why did I marry who I did? And they sort of, you know, think that through and that could actually end in divorce. Any thoughts on that? You could I have, fact, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I just think the fact that both of those numbers, 18% and 39% are below the national average. Um, I've heard elsewhere that uh, divorce in the church is pretty much the same as the national mm -hmm. average. Back when I joined the church, it was lower than, and they um, really bragged about it a lot. But over the years, it came closer and closer to the national average until it basically was the national average. So I think that if it's 18% for people who are still in the church and 39% for, pe for people who have left the church, then what that suggests to me is that a number of these people were getting divorced. I mean, who have left the church were divorced while they were members of the church. And for whatever reason, that may have led them out of the church. Mm -hmm. But it looks like you've got to combine those two to come up to the national average inside the church. And that would be what? 39 plus 18 is 40, 57 percent. Mm -hmm. Take off 7%, you got 50%. Yeah, you're and that's right probably there. how many were in the church when they got divorced the first time, even though they're out of the church now. And I'll just note that the people responding that were responding from the position of being out of the church, those that have gotten divorced, at least some number of those divorces and maybe some significant number were their part, their spouse was in the church. In other words, mm -hmm. a mixed faith marriage. Yes. And we sort of recognize that while the church touts that the divorce rate is extremely low in temple marriages, the church would also, on the other side of the coin, if it came clean, would have to acknowledge that it does a lot of tactics that put a lot of extreme pressure on one spouse when they leave versus the other spouse who stays and is now trying to draw a line in the sand feeling they need to uh, sort of support the church and be loyal to the church rather than to their partner. And when one person leaves and one person stays, there's a lot of differences there that become really difficult to overcome as well. And so I think there's also a lot of data in here. Just saying people get divorced and that's bad sort of misses the mark when we ought to have a long, complex conversation about all the factors in Mormon divorces, both in and out of the church. Yeah, excellent point. There's a lot of complexity and nuance, as we know, in mixed faith marriages. And, and there's another stat about that as we go farther on. So it definitely plays in this whole equation. Let's look at the next one. Okay, not surprising here, people who have left, they have smaller families. Uh, Coates cautioned that the data on this is still provisional uh, because accounting for age will make a major difference in the findings. But in terms of the raw numbers, current Latter-day Saints appear to have almost one child more per family, or 3.4 children, than those who've left the church 2.5. So that's an interesting stat. I, I think maybe simplistically, how many times in the church have we heard, I know there's one more waiting for us, right? That was a big, a big thing when I was having my kids. Everybody was saying that. We're going to have one more. We know they're waiting. So maybe when you don't hear that anymore on the other side, you just have the size of family that you want to have. I don't know. What are your thoughts? It does seem like religious pressure equals one mm -hmm. more kid per household. Yep. yep. Especially courtesy of Elder Anderson, who always wants to talk about that in general conference. And how many women have looked at him and listened to him when he talks about how you need to have more children. They're waiting for you to have them. They're in yep. the pre-mortal existence. Yep. They're drumming their fingers on the table in the spirit world and wanting to come down. And it doesn't make any difference what your health is, what your financial situation is. Even if you almost died having your last child, you still need to have one more. And we hear the success stories in general conference, but the stories that are not successful with the one more child, I don't think we hear so much. 
No, we don't. And I know that's a reality. That was one of the more devastating events of my life where my friend went down that path and did pass away because of complications. So mm. it's a reality. It's a reality. It really that's is. one of the really stories, those very sad yep. stories that you're not going to yep. hear in general conference. Yep. yep, that's exactly right. All right, let's move on. Um, many say they have left the church because of historical issues. Now, this is the one I was most interested in because <laughs> there's a lot of a lot of information out there about why people have stepped away. They want to sin. The new one with Brad Wilcox, it's just trendy and cool. You know, they're too lazy, all these different reasons. But here, this survey actually seems to give some of the answers that I'm familiar with in talking with people and hearing their stories. It says the top three reasons for leaving in the survey, number one, history related to Joseph Smith. Number two, Book of Mormon. And number three, race issues. So this is, I think, one of the only times where I've actually heard these listed out um, in some kind of survey. You always hear the other lazy learner type um, anecdotes. What do you guys think about this? I think that Joseph Smith looks like Landon Brophy and Joseph Smith had a baby. I don't know what happened. That was my AI. And it just came out. That's really funny. Well, that book, is that a book of Mormon? Because it's freaking me out the 3D it's doing. It's like, uh, something that should not exist in the natural world. I know. And he probably has too many fingers and thumbs. I don't know when AI is going to fix that. I don't know why that always happens. <laughs> but you know that uh, the huge survey uh, that John DeLynn was involved in, I think yeah. that was back around 2013, yeah. so around a decade ago, that they did have actual reasons. Yeah. And I think the top one, it had to do with your age. Younger people were more mm -hmm. concerned in leaving the church over social issues like mm -hmm. LGBTQ issues. And older members of the church were predominantly more leaving over the issues of polygamy and finding out how it was that Joseph Smith actually uh, practiced that principle. Yep, I think that's true. And I was kind of surprised that one of those didn't include treatment of people or, as you said, LGBTQ issues. And, and so, again, we don't know exactly the demographic of the sampling. We're not sure. Maybe this indicates that it skews a little older. I'm not sure. Any thoughts on that, Bill? Say that again. I was looking. Oh. I was. I was looking at the comments and seeing if Landon was chiming in about my Joseph Smith comment. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> he might be. I know he had to He's jump there. out of the chat for a little bit, so we'll have to. We'll rewind for him. So no, I just wondered if you had any comments on those reasons because I know they didn't really touch on any of the more treatment of people or things like that that younger people might be interested or more concerned about. But yeah, I think you have to sort of separate them age wise. I think the yeah. church has done a really good job of creating different Mormonisms for different age groups. Yeah. And yeah. just, I think, in the last maybe year or so, kind of uh, collectively putting the Come Follow Me manual as one lesson for everyone, now you'll start to see membership all sort of be on the same page moving forward. Uh, obviously, the older generations uh, still are going to hold on to a lot of the things that were taught in the 80s and 90s, early 2000s. Um, you know, history related Joseph Smith, I think the primary one there that we all see is Joseph Smith's polygamy. Mm -hmm. Uh, Book of Mormon not being an ancient text uh, and the race issues, the church will forever be plagued by its past stances on race until it apologizes. Yep. It refuses to apologize. Hence, it will make race an issue forever and ever and ever. The church can simply apologize, say it did wrong, say prophets aren't always the best uh, litmus test for truth. And then we could all start to move on, but they'll never do that. So. Yeah, the LDS church is like the Fonz on Happy Days. He just can't say he's wrong. <laughs> Does anyone still know who the Fonz is? I, I mean, I do, obviously. But <laughs> the, Arthur Fonzarelli? Look it up, everybody, if you don't know. So, yep, great I comment. So. <laughs> he hey. jumped the shark, right? Yeah, he jumped absolutely. the shark. Hey, that's I right. knew that in real time, that that was the end of that show. Yeah. yeah. Oh, do you know what? I did too. I witnessed the jumping of the shark and I mm -hmm. didn't have those words exactly, but I thought they've really gone too far. I think yes. that's how I thought of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. This then is beyond cool. This has yeah. gone so far beyond cool. It's now dorky. <laughs> and then the word jump the shark, that's where it comes from. In case anyone didn't know, that literally is where the term jump the shark came from that happy days episode. All right, let's move on. Okay. The vast majority has no interest in returning to church activity. Okay, so and we are going to cover more about this 
a wait a bit second, later Rebecca. Shouldn't there be at least 40% who do have an interest yeah. and have returned to church this, activity? This is what we're going to cover because there is some disparity here and some information that we're getting. But for this survey, the postcard survey, the vast majority do not. And I, I mean, look at that purple column there. I mean, the vast majority do not want to return. It says more than four out of five former members say that returning is very unlikely, with an additional 10% saying it's unlikely. So unlikely and very unlikely. You and get to 92, that's 92% when you put unlikely and very unlikely together, isn't it? Very, 92. very unlikely. 92% <laughs> of Latter-day Saints who no longer yeah. believe and have left the church, 92% say they are unlikely or very unlikely to ever go back. And 2% say they're very likely or likely to go back. Yeah. Where's yeah. this 40% coming from? That's what I want to know. We got to yeah. dive into that. Although, and I don't know if this is on a, a slide we're going to go to next, but I do know when people did talk about going back, it usually was a mixed faith marriage. And those dynamics are very complex. And there are reasons that somebody would return, especially if it was a mixed faith scenario, and especially if children were involved. You, you see that all the time where people are making concessions um, just for the sake of peace in the family. So that could factor in too. So I don't think anybody's surprised by this, but it is kind of interesting to see this giant purple column right there, not going back. <laughs> and then I thought this was kind of interesting. Most don't join another religion after leaving. And anecdotally, that's what I've seen. 70% um, of the former members select none when asked to describe their religion now. They say none. I have no religion. However, Coates observed the actual percentage could be even higher because in the survey, an additional 19% chose other. And other could mean, you know, not an organized religion, but something else. And then some handwritten responses sometimes were compatible with none. So they kind of wrote, wrote out what they were doing now. So, and I like my AI, she is running away from a church as fast as she can. But, you know, I do know people that sometimes land for a while, maybe in another Christian church, or they try something, but almost everyone I know, they've just moved past religion. They may have personal spirituality, of course, personal beliefs, practice their own form of religion and spirituality. But as far as organized religion, they just don't want any part of it. What have you guys seen? Well, it's like, it's like I say, I didn't spend 40 years digging my way out of San Quentin to turn myself in at Alcatraz. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So to the first part about people leaving, I've said forever. I mean, I've been, there are people who have done this longer than me, but I've been doing this sort of analysis for 11 years. This road only, I mean, and I've talked to, at this point, a few thousand people face to face. This road only goes one direction and that graph shows it. Uh, in terms of joining another church, I, I gave the community of Christ a try for a while, for a few months. And I wanted something Mormon still, but I had given up most of my literal beliefs in God or for sure Mormonism, uh, Jesus, historical Jesus and all of that. And um, once you deconstruct one religion, you now have the tools to deconstruct all mm -hmm. of them. And hence the data doesn't yeah. surprise me at all. Yeah. And it happens pretty quickly. I find usually people, they jump to another and then they're able to deconstruct that right away too. So Yep, I don't think we're surprised by that at all. So I think that brings us to the end of our eight um, interesting findings from the survey. Um, now, at the same time, <laughs> like I said, it was a big week for a big two weeks for information and data about people staying and leaving. Um, we see this. Somebody on Twitter says, uh, making Keeping Commandments cool again, exploring the stories of XX Latter-day Saints. And somebody has said, and we'll talk about this article in a minute, 40% of people who leave the LDS church actually end up returning. And I think you threw in a clip, didn't you, uh, Bill, so that we can see that in real time? Yeah, let's I let's did. look at this information. Again, coming out the same time as this survey. Oh, I mean, as well, that like we did not expect is about 40% of people who leave like actually come back. And that's something that no one talks about. So just FYI, the gentleman here speaking is one of the, uh, I'm going to say assistant researchers with the project. Mm -hmm. And We'll show, I think, some of this data here coming up, but uh, we just shared the data coming out from Jana Reese, mm -hmm. uh, and this data is coming from a different direction. This mm -hmm. was a study 
of BYU students. And, and again, I'll let you say that, but what surprises me here is that the data on these two sides are just so different. They are claiming that somewhere in the high thirties, up to 40% of people come back to church after leaving it, not believing anymore. Yeah, there couldn't be more of a difference in the data. And who are we supposed to believe? I don't know. <laughs> let's go on to our next slide. Let's see. We'll pass this right here. I okay, feel like so I should believe the guy who looks like he hasn't shaved for the first time in his life yet. <laughs> I, I think that might be it. <laughs> so this article that we're talking about that came out about the same time is Making Keeping Covenants Cool Again, Exploring the Stories of XX Latter-day Saints. And so to be an XX Latter-day Saints means that you're no longer an X, you have returned. This is by Jacob Hess, and this was in um, the Deseret News. So very interesting, this data. As Bill said, it, it just seems to be completely contrary to what we just heard. Um, contrary, this is from this article, to the presumption that once you leave, you don't come back. Professor Sam Hardy at Brigham Young University points to three different data sets that suggest a significant subset of people who leave do come back. In Hardy's own 2023 nationally representative survey of 2030 U.S. adults, now it doesn't say Mormons, it just says U.S. adults, he estimates that 35% of the sample who reported stepping away from religion 22% had reconverted. And in the National Study of Youth and Religion, professors at the University of Notre Dame and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill followed a nationally representative sample of thousands of American teenagers. That's the key. These are teenagers across a decade starting in 20, uh, 2002. Out of 2,207 teenagers who first identified as committed to their faith, 11 reported stepping away after three years, but... After another three years, 36 had come back. So they're kind of using this data, which is not Mormon centric. It's just people in general and religion to show that, yes, some people do leave their religion and some people do come back, but they're presenting it in a really hopeful way. Um, let's read this next part of the article. <laughs> and these are my AI versions of troubled teens. <laughs> In fact, it even says rebellious teen on his shirt. Um, a similar longitudinal study by professors at Brigham Young University, the Family Foundation of Youth Development, followed 1,600 families from Utah, Arizona, and California starting in 2016, 61% identifying as Latter-day Saints. So in this survey, we are talking about people who are members of the church. Of those teenagers, again, teenagers, to me, that's a different issue, who reported being religious at first, 10% stepped away two years later. Of that subgroup, 19% came back within another two years. These shorter term studies don't account for people who return to faith after longer spans of time or who leave again after coming back. So this is presented as, you know, very positive data, but to me, it's almost apples and oranges. What do you guys think? Well, I'm not good at statistics and I've proven it many times on this show, but I know it's 61% of these identify as LDS. But even if 100% had, okay, and it's not 100%, I know that. But if 10% step away, and then of that 10%, 19% come back within two years, we're talking about 1.9%, right, who come back. Is that right? I think that's it. Of the total number. So it's a very, very small number who end up coming back. And frankly, we all know people, although I think it's the exception rather than the rule, who have gone back to church. Mm -hmm. One of them is... Uh, Don Bradley. Yep. Another is a friend of mine uh, from college days who's come back to the church. He stepped away from it, was a big anti Mormon for a long time, many decades. He's come back, got a great mir miracle story about the things that happened and God blessing him. So he came back to church. Mm -hmm. That's two people that I know of. But um, I don't know. The vast majority of people that I am aware of don't go back to church, have no intention of going back to church, and would think that going back to church would be the last thing they would ever do in this or any other lifetime. Yeah, ditto. Um, the idea that 40% return, you know, again, the other study you said was 35% stepped away, 22% of the 35% came back. As you're pointing out here, RFM, 19% of the 10% came back, even using their data. I can't come to the conclusion that 40% come back. Also, when you look at children, when you look at young adults mm -hmm. who said they were religious at one point while they were Maya maids or deacons mm -hmm. or teachers, 
They step away from church for whatever reason that kids or young adults do. And then suddenly you, you're starting to grow up and you, you're going to get married or you're going to uh, start trying to, to adult. Uh, it makes sense that they would go back to church and give that a shot. But that's a very different story than yeah. the 35-year-old, 45-year-old, 55-year-old member of Relief Society or the elders quorum or the high priest who comes to the conclusion after a lot of research that this thing is complete bunk. Yeah, that was my thought. I thought, you know, we're talking about younger people, um, transformative time of life anyway, back and forth. And and I even said that. I said, show me somebody like my co-host on, on Mormonish Landon, you know, 50 years old, finds the book of Abraham, spends four years studying, four years to try to stay in, you know, for his family and his kids and everything. Show me that person who finally stepped away at extreme expense, you know, for everything in his life. The, he he's not represented in this kind of survey. So, and, and I think about, there's a book called The God Virus. It's written by Dr. Del Ray. He's not LDS. Um, he runs Recovery by Religion. And, and he talks about religion in a metaphor of a virus. And you can be infected when you're young. That's when you're the most vulnerable. Your immune system is very you know weak. You're young. And then, you know, you may step away from religion. But later in life, when something happens, some kind of pivotal moment, a tragedy, a problem, that virus is still there. And you turn to that. You know, and I think I think we see that a lot when people step back in. So, yeah, and, and I still don't see any way that you would get 40 percent out of that. But I'll conclude with these final slides. Um, the, this article that we read about coming back, it shared several stories. It's going to be a series. Oh, look, there's my co-host. <laughs> and um, we shared several it shared several stories of people returning. And there is an industry building up around these hopeful, faithful return stories. There's a podcast called come back, where they do share stories of people that have left, stepped away from the LDS church and returned. So I looked at that a little bit. I saw our friend, um, is it Stephen Murphy? Yeah. Mur Mur Mormonism with the Murph. He's an awesome person who had kind of stepped away and he's back and here's his story. I also was kind of surprised to see the story of David Alexander. Um, he's also somebody on the Faithful Mormon side who podcasts a lot. He actually was never a Mormon. It says here that he was an evangelical searching for 47 years for the truth. And I, I'm not sure if that's exactly accurate. I think there might be a little more to that story. Um, but he's also so? on there. I, I think there might be a like little Dave bit more. Paradise put up a parking lot? Yeah, you know, there might be some more to that story. Anecdotally. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard some things. Look it up online. Um, anyway, so, but anyway, stories are, sh are shared here. You can scroll through story after story of people that have come back. There's another one called, let's see, I can't even read that. What does that say? Faith. Sorry. Can you guys read it? I don't Thank know. You. What are you reading? I'm reading the other podcast. Um, These are the stories you've been looking for. Yeah. Faith no, it's up is at the not top. blind. Faith, yeah, that's it. Sorry, I know. You can't even believe how small my screen is. Anyway, it's another podcast where they do share stories. Don Bradley's story I found on this site. And again, you just scroll through. There are positive videos of people returning to the religion. And I can only think that, um, especially some parents maybe whose parents, kids have stepped away, that this would be very important. Um, by the same token, with this industry of all of these kinds of podcasts, we have other kinds of sites and podcasts. We have Was Mormon, where people can log on and share their story, their leaving story, basically. And it's it's a really, oh, it's such a great site. I would encourage anybody to go over there. They they also have all kinds of historical information. But, but you can scroll, again, page after page of people that have stepped away and hear their story. I don't know if you've ever come across this website called Why I Left. What you can do is you go to the map, you find where you live. If you're not comfortable put, putting your pin where you live, you can put it at a stake center or somewhere else. But each little smiley face here represents a person that has left in a geographic area. You might be really shocked to look up where you are. This is just kind of the Wasatch Front, one little area. And when you click on each smiley face, it comes up with a little, you know, just a few words. I left for history. I left during COVID. But you start to see the scope of it. It's all anonymous, but you just start to see that you're not alone. There are so many people that have stepped away. So again, that 40%, I'm not really sure. And I think that RFM is now going to show, share some other statistics um, from the widow's might. They're going to shed even more light on this. Yeah. The widow's might came out with a new report just over this past weekend. And uh, I got a hold of it because it was very simple, very straightforward and quite stunning as to its conclusion 
that the active membership rate of the LDS church has been in decline for the last 10 or so years. Do we have those? By the way, before I start with this, let me make it really clear. I do not care if the LDS church grows or if the LDS church is flatlining or if the LDS church is actually shrinking. It does not matter to me. If the LDS church works for more people or fewer people or the same number of people, God bless them all. But we definitely seem to have a war of numbers and statistics, a tumult of statistics going on here. Because here we have something that does seem to be quite uh, reliable because what the widows might did was they took three data sets, three separate data sets that all reflect on activity, put them together and find out that they are similar in their results, that they are declining in their results and that they are mutually corroborating in their results. Those data sets are uh, donations of LDS members in five countries where it has to be reported, obviously not the US, those countries are the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, reflecting around 4% of all LDS members. That is in green, that's the number one. The second is surveys, cooperative election study survey from 2010 to 2022 it was a 50,000 plus person national US survey. So that's a pretty large pool administered by YouGov, having nothing to do with religion except for some of their questions. Demographic questions included religious affiliation and worship service attendance. And the third one, I think we covered before because this came out as a separate report about the missions and the male missionary service rates, which we had seen went down. Well, now they have two other data sets, the one and the two, which corroborate the third, which make it much more likely that it's accurate and it's not, you know, it's not increasing like the church is saying. So over there on the right, we see how the church has been the church has been reporting its own numbers, going up about one percent per year. So it says the LDS Church reported global membership growth averaging around one percent per year from 2006 to 2022. You almost know that heads would roll if that if the next bar in the sequence ever had to go down below the preceding bar. Something would have to happen. And I think they're getting very, very creative. They're pulling out all the stops in their, their statistics in order to keep that growing. And this is why. If we can go to the next one. Here are those three data sets mapped. It says we index the three LDS church activity related data sets to 100, which means we're just going to pin them where they started at 100. And we're going to have to do it at 100. We can't do it at zero because they're going to go down, right? So we'll pin them at the starting place at 100 and see what happens. Uh, beginning at the first year of each series, they don't all start in the same year. Each series exhibits a similar negative trend, a mutually corroborating signal that member activity rates are falling. So there you have the blue, which if you remember was the, the male members serving missions. Hang on a sec. And just remember that little blip there of the peak is when the missionary age got lowered. Hence, you had an influx of missionaries who came out before their normal time would have been. So you sort of get some overlap and it's sort of a false peak. Right. And it's possible that last little blip up may also be false, may have to do with the COVID. Uh, uh, the re-enlistment for the people who deferred going on their missions because of COVID it might be a little blip up, but it's probably going to keep yeah. going down. We talked about that last time. Good thing to bring it up again. Then the red shows the um, the surveys, that 50,000 plus survey. And if you take it, the time period, all of a sudden you get a similar, very similar kind of decline rate to the member missionaries, the male missionary serving. And then the green line, which is the number of member households paying a full tithe in those five countries that have to report it. And you see a very similar decline rate across all three data sets. So... All of the preceding analysis is based on a study of publicly available data. And the donations, reported member donations in five countries, lag what would be expected if active membership were stable based on wage inflation. So they took wage inflation into account in doing this as well. Very smart people here running this widow's might thing. I got to tell you that. Source links and our analysis of each country's reported donations, they give links where you can find the data. 
that they are basing this on. So you can do your own analysis as well. They're asking nobody to take their word for it. They give all their, their sources. And the same thing with number two, the surveys, and number three, the missions. But all three of them, same basic declining rate. Uh, do we have the next slide? Maybe I can go to it. Oops, sorry. We both did it. Uh, and there we have all those three together, the CCES survey, the LDS church affiliation and activity. And you see them all going down, reinforcing each other. On the right-hand side, the census-based activity indicator from four different countries. Excuse me. All showing the same kind of um, uh, line, and it's all going down. There's no one that's going up. They're all trending down, which means that active membership rates are decreasing over the last 10 years or so in the LDS church. Any thoughts? So um, when you take Jana's data and you combine it with the widow's might, it seems like there is a significant decrease in belief and activity happening in the LDS church, but everything they want to say out loud, everything, this report that they had a hand in with the research of BYU uh, students and teenagers and all that stuff that they did, um, it seems like they're really trying hard to make it look like this is a growing church, but the, the credible data seems to be indicating a, not just a drop-off, but a significant drop-off. What do you think, Rebecca? Yeah, I just kind of feel like if their news were good, they would report it. <laughs> like they used to so proudly get up at conference and give their statistics before anyone knew how to crunch statistics or get online and find real statistics. I just feel like if the news were good, they would be reporting that. So I think that we're seeing it from all different sources now. We can kind of put this together to try to form a picture because, again, the LDS Church is not forthcoming on this data. This all has to kind of be extrapolated from countries where there is forced transparency, you know, through governmental regulations. And every single place there is this transparency, these are the kinds of things that we see. It makes me believe it's probably happening everywhere. Something that Maven had just put up as a comment or somebody put up there was really, really uh, struck me because this is what I had thought too. She put it much better than I had thought it, but it's like, I thought that people were, I thought the church was strong. The church membership uh, growth was strong according to Elder Cook in a prior conference. And okay, so mem people aren't really leaving per Elder Cook, but if they are, they're totally coming back. So which is it? These seem to be mutually inconsistent. Either they're not leaving like people think they are, or they are leaving and they're coming back, but it doesn't make sense to have both of those being stated by the same entity, i.e. the LDS church, which seems to be the case. They are not leaving, but if they are, they're totally coming back. Great <laughs> comment, Maven. By the way, if you if you really are a church that is as strong as you've ever been and people are not leaving, there isn't any need to tell people how many people are coming back of those who are leaving, right? In, in other words, I know what you're saying, but there's also this added point of, this, the idea of who's coming back would just be a nothing. It would not even be interesting to the church if people weren't leaving in the first place. It seems as though that validates that large numbers of people are, in fact, leaving. Yes, they're tipping their hand again. They're tipping their hand. I, I also think that people may be Mormoning in sort of a hybrid way. Like on Sunday, you drive past, I mean, I'm here in the heart of the heart of Utah County, you drive past churches that are full. The parking lot is overflowing. However, at the same time, you drive past Walmart and that parking lot is full and there are people walking into Walmart in suits, ties, Sunday dresses. So I almost feel like people are in it or of it, but not in it. There's just sort of this hybrid way, very different from when I was growing up. The people maybe are still attending church, but they're 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 living their own personal version of Mormonism where they can do other things and they're kind of back and forth and in and out. So I think it's morphing in a way. And I don't know how you quantify that. That's the thing. Are you an active Mormon if you go to maybe one of your meetings and then go to the movies? I don't know, but people seem to be doing that. It's like the Lord of the Rings. When those hobbits came back to the Shire 13 months to the day after they left, and they knew, and everybody else in the Shire knew, that these hobbits that left and came back were not the same hobbits. Yep. They were not the same hobbits at all. They did not fit in. 
And so any Mormons who do go back, I expect they're not the same mm -hmm. Mormons as they were when they left the church. It, it, when you look at the data point there on the left, you know, starting back in the first of those three subsets when they started collecting data before 2010, 2009 maybe was when that started. And, you know, they start off with saying, okay, this is where we're going to start all of this research. So it starts here with the church having 100% of whatever we started with. That, that makes sense. Now, here we are in 2024. The research has come in from 2023 and before. And what their data is saying is that we're, we, are, we have lost somewhere between, I think, I don't know what the number was, and maybe that's in another slide here, but five to 20%. But this here shows 100% down to like 65%, which means if, if we understand those lines to be accurate, we're talking about a decrease of around 35% in activity since 2009. RFM? Yeah, Bill, uh, just so you know, yeah, yeah, those are not percentage points. They just pegged it arbitrarily at 100 so they could track the downward. Gotcha. So if we can go to the very first part of this, oh, I can do it. <laughs> we can go here, right? Yeah, there it in is. In these data sets, the in, this third paragraph in the top, in these data sets, the indicated attrition rates point to active LDS membership falling by 5 to 19% from 2016 to 2022. That's their conclusion. Yeah, so even if we just go down the middle of that somewhere, 12% or so, mm -hmm. um, that's a very different number than what the church is trying to convey to you. And I will say that it's possible for both of these things to be true. Uh, once again, Mr. Statistician, RFM, who's horrible at this, but I think this is correct. If, because they're, they're measuring different things. The one with the, the church's growth is measuring total number of members regardless of activity, right? And what the widow's mite is looking at is the activity rate going down. It is possible total membership could be increasing while active membership is declining. But I think what that means is that, say, if it's for every active person that you convert and baptize who's going to be active, if you lost one active person, that would keep things even. So I think what's going on is that for every, if both are true, and I got my doubts about it, but I'm trying to be charitable here. It's what I was taught in Sunday school. If both are true, then for every active person that they're baptizing, they're losing two active members and possibly three. And that's yeah. only if every active member that they baptize remains active. And we know that's mm -hmm. not the case. Mm -hmm. So they're actually going to have to do about three times as many baptisms in order to make up for all the people they're losing for this blue lined increase of total membership the church proposes to be true. I think that's correct. Yeah. A and all three of these indicators could be overcome by, say, significant growth in Africa or Somalia or Ecuador, or wherever. Um, but, it, but we should at least note that in the developed countries where this data is coming from, including the United States, it seems like the activity rate is in a, I won't say significant decline, but certainly in something more than stale and stagnant. Yeah, and remember our report from a couple of weeks ago on cell phone data. Mm -hmm. That corroborates it too, because that that tracked how often people were in the building, attended, you know, being an, a religious attender, right, of church. And it was very small. It was like 15%. I mean, so that it kind of, I think the cell phone data also points this direction. Yeah, you're right. There are multiple sets of data that indicate <laughs> a lowering and a decrease of activity, activity rates. There's only one set of data that I can see. It's a church's data that continues to increase and they refuse to tell us how they come to those numbers. I believe they do. Yeah. So make of that what you will. <sighs> and then there was two more slides if those have any importance to... Uh the conversation rfm oh yeah i had gone backward in order to get to that first slide to read that paragraph oh i gotcha yeah and i think i've gone through them and gotcha. uh done with that now panel discussion take it away yeah so just let's just talk for a moment we've sort of talked all the way through with this but it would seem to me if i go first it would seem to me that it's quite obvious that the credible data is that the church is in decline at least in developed countries 
that when you start talking about if you're going to make that up in growth in underdeveloped countries or developing countries, you're going to certainly spend a lot more money there than it's coming in. The church seems to want to portray itself as strong and getting stronger by the day. The numbers in multiple places coming in seems to indicate that we are talking about something other than what the narrative the church would like to to impose. Your thoughts? I will just tell you that, as I recall, it was back in 2010, I believe was the year, and that's when these numbers start, that um, former LDS church historian, uh, it was Marlon Jensen at the time, was recorded as stating that the church has never seen so much apostasy going on as of 2010 since the days of Kirtland. And I think that these um, statistics by the widow's might corroborate that. And the statistics by the church contradict it. Yeah. And didn't they say the best and the brightest were leaving? I remember them saying oh, that yeah. even from the pulpit. Yeah. And I kind of, I mean, I look at the statistics, but I also look at just personal experience. In 2004 is the first time I remember of hearing someone in my ward leaving, you know, very visibly. They went and they told the bishop, we don't believe anymore. And they left. These were, you know, people I, I think I was serving and scouting with the wife. I remember being really surprised. It's the first case I had heard of it. And then if I was honest with myself, I remember being very jealous and thinking, how do you do that? You know, <laughs> It was the first time I'd heard of someone doing it. And, and then flash forward, you know, a decade or so, and I'm in primary and I hear the question from the primary president, how many of you have have people in your family, I'm sorry if I'm triggering people with my primary voice, but that's what it's like, who don't go to church anymore, she asked. And I remember looking around the room, I was the primary pianist, almost every child raised their hand. This was not, this This was a question that they were asking. They were going to help the children deal with this and, and see if they could find ways to help them feel okay or maybe try to reactivate, but everyone raised their hand and they actually said it out loud in primary. So that told me it was a snowball and I think it continues to be a snowball. Um, yeah. And the, I was going to say the church statistics, I'm sorry, Bill, no, no, uh, go ahead. also contradict all the, the hijinks that we see going on with the combining of missions, mm -hmm. with the combining of wards, with the combining of stakes, all doing it to try and make it look like it's growing when actually they're cutting down the number of membership in each ward and the number of wards in each stake and the number of missionaries in each mission. Yeah, they're doing everything they can to cook these books and try and make it look like they're growing when actually all they're doing is having bigger uh, I don't know, potato bags with fewer potatoes in them, selling for more at the store. I don't know if that's a good analogy or not, but all it is is smoke and mirrors. Yeah, combining the elders quorum and the high priest uh, as another yeah. one. And and just really? note too, how much of an emphasis has the church leadership placed on doubts and talking, uh, having mm -hmm. talks centered around the fact that there are problematic issues, uh, putting out the gospel topic essays, uh, it, it seems like whenever the youth are, or the, the church leaders are talking to the youth, they're talking about things in church history. You know, we didn't hide anything. You should know that. Yeah. So it seems like a significant emphasis from the top church leadership to talk about things in a way that would indicate people are also leaving in some sort of mass scale. Lowering the missionary age, uh, starting the program while you're still on your mission about being retained in the church mm -hmm. and having somebody on the other end when you get off your mission to mentor you and make sure that you stay in the church. Oh yeah, it's a problem. If it weren't a problem, they wouldn't be doing all of these programs. Yeah, you got it. Okay. Anything else from you, RFM? I think I said my piece. Thank you so much, Mr. Real. Sweet. All right. Well then let's, uh, let me put up on the screen here. We'll end with a little bit of, uh, part of me wants to laugh. No. And part of me wants part to me go, wants oh, to my, oh my gosh, I can't believe they did this. I was watching but, The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb last night. This looks like, you know, one of the excerpts. Oh my God. Yeah. And oh. I was actually going to play the, the bit here for everybody. So here it is. This is just a little one-minute synopsis of it. A covenant is a pledge that we should prepare for, clearly understand, and absolutely honor these five covenants, however, are not separable. You can't choose to make a subset of the five. You make all five or none. We tie you up really good or Each else. Each covenant yeah. adds a bond, drawing us closer to and strengthening our connection with God. We further decrease our risk 
to yeah. separate ourselves from God because the bond is stronger and draws us closer. In other words, making multiple covenants along the covenant path helps us mature <laughs> in our discipleship. As you accept this invitation, this too will have the metaphorical effect of shrinking the green exercise band, drawing you closer to Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ and strengthening your covenantal bonds with them. Whether you have one, two, or three loops, heed the Savior's caution. Whoever said the church leadership wasn't into BDSM, right? Oh my gosh. So, Did they not run these things through past people before they do them for the optics? Look at that yeah. picture. I can't even look at that picture. Women and and uh, people of ethnicity are tied on the stage, have their hands tied. I thought, you Come know, you guys remember, you guys remember maybe seven years ago or so, Elder Bednar does this thing where he's talking to the youth and he grabs this like 10-year-old yep. kid yep. and he holds the yep. kid and won't let him go. And the kid ends up crying. You know, the kid yep. is traumatized. Some grown man who he really doesn't know. I mean, you can say Elder Bednar is an apostle yeah. of the Lord. For a 10-year-old, you're like, I don't know that guy. So Elder Bednar grabs this kid and holds yeah. him tight, and the kid cries. And I knew, you don't yeah. do that. Like, that yeah. is, that's an inappropriate thing to take a kid who's a stranger to you and compel them to do anything. Yep. Um, this is the thing your parents warn you about, right? No, I uh, thought that exact same thing when I saw this. And I guess maybe we should explain for those that aren't familiar with this. It was a devotional at BYU. The metaphor, of course, is the covenant path. And I love how he says bond because bond also means bonds right there, right? And so he had his wife come up and wrap these bands around these students. The first one was baptism. You know, you're sort of locked in with baptism. The second one, endowment. You're even more locked in. The third one, marriage, you know, and or I think... I think it was marriage. Yeah. And then I think maybe I'm getting them out of order, but anyway, wrapped around and around with the steps of the covenant path until you finally can't move into him. You're, you would, you're here forever. It's safety. But to, when I'm looking at you're trapped. And the thing I hate about this covenant path idea, sorry, my soapbox mm -hmm. is that now, you know, they used to say you made these promises at baptism. So you damn well better live up to them. Right. 18 year old considering not going on a mission. And now they're even saying that you made these promises on the covenant path in the premortal life. It's something that you don't even know or remember. They are just trapping you just like these rubber bands where, you know, for the people that really believe this, there's no way out. It's very disturbing. And this optically is just, and I guess he he also called them his victims. Let's have our victims come up on stage. And he was encouraging his wife, tie it tighter. I mean, you really can't make this up. That's what I'm trying to say. That girl next to Sister Renland, notice her hands are darker than her arms. I mean, that thing's tight. Yeah. Really um, tight. Yeah, she's got marks on her wrist. I did notice that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it seems crystal clear that while he doesn't recognize it, what he's actually teaching is that once you join this church, it will give you so many things to do and tell you that you're bound by them, that you will be trapped in this faith for practically forever, yeah. maybe even time and all eternity. What I appreciate about Elder Renland is he has a way of choosing analogies <laughs> that actually tell the truth. Yes. About the LDS church. Remember the time. Yeah. I mean, we've got uh, Elder Uchtdorf by comparison who compares the church. If you're going to compare the church to a boat, it's going to be a luxury cruise, right? So that's Elder Uchtdorf's <laughs> comparison. But when it came to Elder Rinland just a few years ago and his wife who's standing there, they decided to analogize the church to a dilapidated yeah. dinghy with a hard a hard of hearing pilot. <laughs> Do you remember that one? I do. Yeah, we did about three hours on it. <laughs> <laughs> and here he's doing with the covenant path what it, the, it really is. Yeah. The covenant path is there to bind you to the church. That is its purpose. And the covenant path make sequential covenants. The first one, baptism. Nope, that's not going to be strong enough to keep you bound in the church. And the symbolisms are not of liberty and freedom. They are of servitude and bondage. And that is what the covenant path is. So thank you, Elder and Sister Renland, again. One, baptism, not strong enough. You could still escape. By the way, to be fair, he's saying one arm is you and the other arm is God. 
exactly. you're being bound to God. But I think we all know what the reality is. Yep. The second one, because people don't have to go through these covenants to be bound to God. I suppose Sister Teresa or Francis of Assisi may have been bound to God without the covenants. I'm just saying it's a counterexample. Second person, now it's baptism and getting endowed mm -hmm. in the temple. Okay, well, now you're bound tighter, but you can still get out. Okay, so now we need the sealing. We need the sealing in the temple. And once you've been sealed in the temple, you're going to be bound so tight to this church that you cannot escape. And the funny thing is, is that they end up replicating what it is the church is taught from its inception almost is the role of Satan. We have the idea with um, uh, Elder Bednar, who's taken agency and made it moral agency, which actually means no agency, and you don't get to choose. You have to do what it is you're supposed to do, okay? That's how we retranslate agency. And here, there are a number of scriptures that this replicates, but the scriptures from the Book of Mormon are not talking about God. They're supposed to be talking about Satan. Let me give you a couple, okay? 2 Nephi 26, 22. Speaking, uh, I'm just going to read from this uh, article from February 2019 uh, in the Enzyme magazine called Free to Choose. The adversary doesn't stop after we have decided to commit one sin. He wants us in his power. The Book of Mormon teaches us about his tactics. That's Satan's tactics, the adversary's tactics, the bad guy's tactics to bring people into bondage by degrees. Yes, by degrees. Quote, he leadeth them by the neck with a flaxen cord until he bindeth them with his strong cords forever. That's the Book of Mormon talking about Satan. Does that look like what's going on with Elder and Sister Renland? You decide. And in 2 Nephi 28, 22, a couple of chapters later, we also read, quote, Others he flattereth away and telleth them there is no hell. And he saith unto them, I am no devil, for there is none. Well, obviously, Elder Renland is not saying he's the devil. <laughs> He represents God. He's an apostle, right? And thus he whispereth in their ears until he grasps them with his awful chains. They are trapped. <clears throat> They're stuck. Boy, oh boy. Yeah. There you go. Teaching the truth, really. The huh? LDS Church ends up fulfilling Book of Mormon descriptions and prophecies of the Antichrist and the false religions that will arise in the last days. And it does it with a fervor that you would almost think they're trying to do it. Mm. Uh, yeah, I ended up sharing the dilapidated dinghy and the whack-a-mole Radio Free Mormon episode. I got the chance to sort of be on that with you. And we I think we went on for about three hours, a part one and at least a part two. Um, any final comments from you guys? Anything else that happened over the course of the week that you guys want to uh, mention? Otherwise, I'll close out the show. But... The church just keeps on doing its thing. It does roll forth sort of like a stone cut out of the mountain without hands. It's just going the wrong direction. Yeah, and crushing vast numbers of people on its way. Yeah. Anything else from you guys? I've said everything I want to say. I had a great time tonight, and thank you for including me in this enjoyable discussion. You're welcome. <laughs> Rebecca. Yep, it's always fun. It's always good. And and we're sad that we missed last week, but I think we came back with a bang, didn't we? So it's all good. We're on track. Love it. We were Check at Thrive. Out. RFM and I were hanging out. Bill was doing birthday stuff. So it was a good time. Yeah. Check out Rebecca Biblioteca at the Mormonish podcast. You also have a Mormonish YouTube channel. Uh, you and Landon Brophy uh, yep. do that show. You can check out Radio Free Mormon at RadioFreeMormon.org or the Mormon Discussion YouTube channel. You can also check out Radio Free Mormon's Shakespeare podcast or Mormon Sunday School. And uh, I co-host with RFM on Mormonism Live on Wednesday nights. And uh, we have a lot of fun doing that at 6.20 p.m. on Wednesdays, Mountain Time. And that's also on the Mormon Discussion YouTube channel. Folks, have a great night. And uh, we appreciate all of you following along. If you have any uh, news to break, just put it in the comments down below on this episode. And we'll we'll check that out and notice those. And folks, we hope you have a great week and we'll see you next Monday at 6 p.m. Bye-bye.